Hi, my name is uh, John Hoffman. As uh, Jake said, I'm a rising fifth year grad student at Princeton in the Astrophysical Sciences Department. And I'm talking today about a fast template periodogram. So I'll explain what that means. Um, but this is work that I've been doing in collaboration with Jake here, as well as my advisors at Princeton, uh, Joel Hartman and Gash Barbaco. So um, a fast template periodogram for those of you who might not be familiar with uh, time series analysis and astronomy. Uh, periodograms are similar, analogous to fast Fourier transforms. There are some subtle differences, which I'll, I'll go over a little bit later. And um, a template periodogram, you can very crudely think of as doing a Fourier transform, but for a non-sinusoidal function. That's a terrible uh, way of explaining it, but you can roughly think of it like that. OK, so I'll talk about periodic signals and astrophysical time series first. I'll get into what exactly a periodogram is. Then I'll talk about a template periodogram and some work that we've been doing to make things faster and more accurate. So periodic signals, many of you probably know, are ubiquitous in astronomy. So I've put up three examples here just to give some illustration of the range of periodic signals that we see in astrophysical time series data. So RR Lyrae are a type of pulsating variable star. So these are stars that have a thin a hydrogen shell close to the surface of the star. And at a very particular time scale, that shell will ignite, the star will expand, it'll cool off, and then it'll contract, and then it'll ignite the uh, hydrogen shell again. So uh, it's exactly like a piston engine works, and it happens at a very regular, uh, very regular time scale. So uh, eclipsing binaries are two stars that are gravitationally bound. And if you're lucky enough to be looking uh, down the plane of the, down, down the orbital plane, you'll see one star pass in front of the other. And that'll cause a dip in the brightness of the system that you're looking at. And then when the other star passes in front of that star, you'll see another dip in brightness. And then the coolest one, I think, on this slide are transiting exoplanets because exoplanets are the best, obviously. Um, exoplanets are just like an eclipsing binary system, except <coughs> instead of another star, it's a, it's a planet passing in front of a host star. So uh, transiting exoplanets are really hard to find because they're very shallow changes in brightness. And usually the orbital period is very long compared to the amount of time that it spends in front of the star. So you, if you phase fold, as they say in astronomy, this light curve, which basically means you take some frequency and then reorder the data so that it's in order uh, in, in, in terms of the phase of the signal, then um, you'll see this very thin and shallow dip. So it, as it looks like, it's a very hard signal to detect. So how do we detect these signals? Well, the first thing you'll probably think of is running a fast Fourier transform. So for those of you who aren't familiar with a Fourier transform, Fourier transform just takes a signal, a waveform, and it decomposes it into its different frequency components. So that's good if you're looking for a periodic signal, because if you run a Fourier transform on your signal, what you should see is a very strong peak at the periodic periodicity of, uh, of the signal that you're looking at. But the problem, of course, in astronomy is that uh, the periodic, uh, for the time series that we're looking at are not regularly sampled, so that throws the fast version of the Fourier transform out the window. And you're left with running a discrete Fourier transform, which doesn't require your data be evenly sampled. But the problem with uneven sampling, another problem of uneven sampling is that your window function that you're, that you're observing the underlying signal with is no longer a simple, what's called a Dirac comb. So if you're looking at a continuous function, you're observing it at a certain amount of discrete times. If, it, if it's a regularly sampled data, then you're looking at a bunch, the window functions, a bunch of delta functions that are equally spaced from each other. So the Fourier transform of a delta comb is another delta comb, and that's a very easy window function to work with. When you go from evenly sampled data to unevenly sampled data, net, that's no longer true. So you have a very complicated window function, and this brings what looks like noise into the power spectrum. Um, but what you're actually seeing is that the frequency components are no longer independent of one another. So you can rewrite the discrete Fourier transform like this. And people do use the discrete Fourier transform in astronomy. It's also called the Schuster or the classical periodogram. I don't know why we renamed the discrete Fourier transform. Um, but what people use more often in astronomy is something called the Lomb-Scargill periodogram. So it's a slightly 
modified version of a discrete Fourier transform, where instead of this one over n factor out in front, you have um, one over the sum of the squares of cosines. And so the reason why we use this is that it has some convenient properties. So for example, first of all, in the limit that you have evenly sampled data, it's equivalent to running a discrete Fourier transform, so that's good. Um, this tau parameter would, is just defined so that it's invariant under global time shifts, so that's good. Uh, but the advantage it has over running a discrete Fourier transform is for unevenly sampled data, the, um, the amplitude is chi-square distributed if your uncertainties are Gaussian. So that's good for hypothesis testing. So if you're looking at a star and you have a null hypothesis, of there's no signal there, it's just a constant. Uh, signal that we're looking at, this property is good for rejecting that null hypothesis. Of course, in astronomy, those assumptions are almost never true, uh, but nevertheless, that's, that's a more convenient way of, uh, of parameterizing the Fourier transform. So another way of looking at this problem is through the lens of least squares analysis and saying, okay, well, I have a model that I'm trying to fit to my data, and uh, to find the best fit model, I want to minimize the squares of the residuals between my model and the data, weighted by the uncertainties in your observations. So that's how you define this chi-squared parameter, and then you add a hat, just, I mean, this is just, uh, uh, you know, just for the sake of this presentation, is that this is the minimum value of this chi-squared parameter. So you just find the, the parameters of your model that minimize the sum of the squares of the residuals. And it turns out that the lomsk gargle periodogram is equivalent to doing least squares fitting of sinusoids to your data. So it's just a cosine with a phase shift, and it's written as a cosine and a sine function because the relative amplitudes you can translate into a phase shift. This is just more, this is a linear uh, formulation of that same model. So this PLS, which I've, is just a, uh, I've rewritten the one over n x hat squared. It just stands for power periodogram, but this is what you'll probably see in the literature. Um, it's equivalent to writing chi hat squared naught, which is your uh, chi hat for a best fit constant model, minus the chi hat squared for your periodic model. So it gives, a, it gives the improvement of the fit for your model versus your null hypothesis, so to speak. And the nice thing about this is that we can turn it around and say, well, we can take that as the definition of a periodogram and swap out the model. So you can then, this is the same periodogram, just sort of scaled a little differently. Um, and then you can use any model that you can come up with, and in principle, any fiducial model that you can come up with, but usually the fiducial model is just a constant, uh, constant fit. So one extension is to add a floating mean. So the lomsk scargle the original formulation, assumes that this theta three, this offset, is zero. Another way of saying that is it assumes that the mean of your observations is the mean of your signal. And that sounds reasonable. In a lot of cases, that is the case. But uh, you might run into this situation where you're looking at a periodically varying object. And when it gets too dim, you can no longer observe it. So now you're observing only, you're sampling only part of the signal for that object. So the mean of your data is biased against the, the actual mean of the signal. And adding this constant offset helps deal with that problem. Um, another extension is to add higher order harmonics. So you can say, well, I'm not looking for a sinusoidal signal. I know that it'll probably not look like that. I'm looking for, say, RR Lyrae, and I know they're not sinusoidal. So you can add higher order harmonics, and this allows for a more flexible fit to any, uh, any data that you're looking at. The penalty that comes along with that flexibility is um, you've added more free parameters to your model, so you're not as sensitive as you were by just having a simple lomsk gargle periodogram. Another extension, if you look for planets, you probably want run what's called a box least squares periodogram. And that's exactly what, so it's exactly what it sounds like. You're looking for signals that look like a little box in the face folded, um, face -folded light curve. And if you're looking for a signal that looks like this with a lomsk gargle periodogram, you're basically out of luck. I mean, this is not a sign, it's a very sharp feature. It doesn't look anything like a sine function. So um, this, allows you to have much higher signal-to-noise for planetary transits, for instance. Uh, 
And then, of course, um, another extension is the template periodogram. So template periodogram is basically lumps gargle, but instead of a cosine function, you just throw in a black box function. So now you have the same three free parameters. You have amplitude, offset, and a phase shift parameter. You have to align it with your data. But this M here, it can be anything. So it can be an eclipsing binary template. It can be an ROI rate template. It can be whatever signal that you're looking for. And people do use this in astronomy. So just recently, there was a paper that came out earlier this year uh, by Branimir Cesar looking for RR Lyrae in the PanStars first data release. So PanStars is quite a challenging data set to work with if you're looking for, if you're trying to do this, because there's only a handful of observations on the order of, I think, 20 to 50. I'm not sure what the exact number is. And they're all taken in five different filters not at the same time. So you might have one observation in the red filter, and then 20 days later, one observation in the green filter. So that's a nightmare if you're looking for something with a known shape, and then that shape is color dependent, which is the case for our library. It looks different in the green filter versus in the red filter. So um, they cleverly um, formulated a template periodogram that was multidimensional. So they enforced that they took templates from SDSS Stripe 82 RR libraries, just empirical observations of what RR library look like. And then they enforce that all of them have to be aligned. They all have to have the same relative offsets. So now there's only three free parameters since they all have the same relative offsets. They're all aligned, so they all have the same phase, and they all have the same relative amplitude. So they were able to get really high signal to noise, but it was really slow to do that. They could only run that on a small portion of the stars that they were looking at. And um, it's not always accurate. I mean, if you're doing this, you are doing nonlinear optimization. It's not linear in phase, because that's the black box functions. That's an H you can't just separate, separate out phase from that. Um, so it's very flexible. You know, you can use whatever template you want to use. You can use as many templates as you want to use and take the best fit. And it's powerful because if you're using only one template, there's only one degree of freedom. If you're using more than one template, then obviously there's more inherent degrees of freedom. It's not obvious how many there would be. But the other problem is that it's not always accurate because you're doing nonlinear optimization. You're likely to fall into uh, local minima in that in that optimization surface. So. This is, again, the multi-harmonic periodogram. And as I said before, or actually several times, these are free parameters. So this is the uh, advantage and the disadvantage of the multi-harmonic periodogram. It gives you the flexibility. But if you expand your template as a truncated Fourier series, you basically get something that looks very similar to the multi-harmonic peri periodogram, or the multi-harmonic model, except that these CN and SN uh, parameters are fixed. So it's just a reparameterization of your template, basically. Um, this is what a template periodogram looks like if you run it with different Fourier, uh, truncate the Fourier series with a different number of harmonics. So this black curve you see on your right is uh, the template periodogram with one harmonic, two harmonics, five harmonics, nine harmonics, and ten harmonics. So. Um, the first one is obviously one harmonic that's just Lomb's gargle. And this is run for an eclipsing binary template. So this is the same template that I showed you earlier, that you've seen earlier in this presentation. The blue curve is the multi-harmonic Lomb's gargle with the same number of harmonics. And then at the very bottom, you see this purple curve, which is uh, Boxley squares. So you see sort of what you would expect. So if you use a multi-harmonic periodogram, you have the uh, that same peak as you saw in the original lump scargle at, at uh, the top because the multi-harmonic lump scargle will find an equal or better fit than the lump scargle because it's a, you have more free parameters for your model. Um, as you add more harmonics, you become less and less sensitive to whatever signal you're looking for. And I mean, this is a bit of a cheat. So this data is generated from this template. So we know that we're looking for the right signal. Obviously, that's never really the case in the real world. But this just illustrates the advantage of knowing the signal that you're looking for and actually looking for it instead of running something like a lump scargle. OK, so I'm not going to go through the whole derivation for the, the uh, template periodogram because it took me a while, and it's really messy, and it would put you more to sleep than you already are. So I'll just go through the gist. If you take, if you make a um, transformation of variables, this psi thing, so just e to the i, 
theta 2, theta 2 is your fascia parameter, you can rewrite everything in a more convenient way. And if you derive the periodogram, um, you get a lot of terms that look like this. So your Wn is your relative weights for your observations. It's proportional to 1 over the uncertainty squared. Your y of n are your brightness measurements. And this f of psi is just some nonlinear function of your phase shift. So all the, non, all the difficulty of deriving a periodogram comes from the fact that it's not linear, and you have to solve for that nonlinear function of the, uh, involving the phase shift. But the nice part about this is now you can separate out the nonlinearity into its own thing. So if you separate out the nonlinearity, you're left with just a Fourier transform of the convolution of your weights and your observations. So what I didn't tell you earlier is that there's something called a non-equispaced fast Fourier transform. So um, this is something that's been around for a little while, and Jake Vanderplas actually wrote a nice Python, purely Python implementation of it. Um, and it allows, it solves the problem that uh, we couldn't solve before, which is that the Fourier transform doesn't allow you to use. You can't run a Fourier transform on une unevenly sampled data. Um, but it turns out through a couple of clever tricks, you can, sort of. So you can use that algorithm to compute your, uh, the rest of the coefficients and then deal with the nonlinearity separately. So the gist of the story is that the nonlinearity for this problem reduces to polynomial zero finding. So you can represent the nonlinearity as a polynomial in this psi parameter, which is a complex variable. Uh, and then you, you're stuck with solving the zeros of a polynomial of order 6h minus 1. h is the number of harmonics that you expand your template in. And uh, so you're stuck finding the zeros of that polynomial. The coefficients of that polynomial, which again we use the Fourier transform to compute, that scales as HNF log HNF. So NF is the number of trial frequencies that you're using. So that scales as N log N, which is great. And then finding the zeros scales with as a constant amount of time per trial frequency. But in terms of the number of harmonics that you're expanding your template out, so if you expand it, if you're Basically, the number of harmonics that you need to expand your template in is basically described by how many sharp features there are in your template. So if, like for a box least squares template, you're lost. I mean, you need like hundreds of harmonics for a very, very sharp feature. Um, but if your template's sufficiently smooth, you don't need many. So as long as you have like less than about 10, you'll get a reasonable speed up. Um, so the zero finding skills is the cube of the number of harmonics. So this is really the limitation. So this is why you can't replace uh, box least squares with this formulation, because it would just uh, take way too long. Um, and the reason it scales as h to the cube is that you do a lot of singular value decomposition of a polynomial companion matrix, which is how NumPy uh, solves for the roots of a polynomial. Now, the naive way, if you just use nonlinear optimization, scales as the number of observations you have times the number of frequencies. So if you have a very small number of observations, occasionally you can do a bit better, but you still lose the accuracy. Um, and I haven't really found a case where it's consistently faster than, uh, than doing it this way. So if you uh, take the naive method, if you compare doing, using this uh, fast template periodogram uh, with doing things the more naive way, if you use one initial guess for that when, when you're doing the nonlinear optimization part, when you're trying to find the optimal phase shift, if you just use one initial guess, your accuracy is terrible um, because you get stuck in a local minimum. I mean, it just almost always happens. If you use 10 initial guesses, you do a lot better, but you're still not perfectly accurate. But that seems pretty, pretty reasonable to be uh, practical. But it's also a lot faster. So these are compared with using uh, 10 random uh, starting points. And uh, you get like an order of magnitude speed up in just about every case, along with a, a, better, a better scaling. So this is really good if you're trying to do this with a lot of data points. So my advisors run the HatNet and HatSouth, the Hat project, which looks for a lot of transiting exoplanets from the ground. Uh, and they have tens of thousands of data points per source. So running a template periodogram on each one, and they have like 5 million stars or something, which is actually kind of puny compared to like LSST and a lot of other experiments. So um, running a template periodogram 
on our data with 10,000 points is basically an impossibility. Um, and we're not even really guaranteed to get an optimal solution. So this helps in that case. It's still not really fast enough to be practical yet, but I'm really hoping that there's a lot more speed ups to be found. Um, so yes, all right, so there is an implementation of this with uh, thanks to Jake Vanderbilt's help. Uh, it only really requires the NFFT package for the non equal space fast Fourier transform, which Jake wrote, it's in pure Python, very easy to install. Everything else is just NumPy and SciPy. So it's unit tested, it's documented, and um, there's a lot more to do. I have a lot more to do with my thesis as much as I want to make this thing even faster. My advisors will probably murder me. So I encourage you, if you're interested in this, to take a look, try to find things that are uh, slow or inefficient or that you know you think you can make faster. Um, because if this is, if, if we could make this, I'd say maybe about an order or two magnitude uh, or, or two of magnitude faster, um, this would be really useful. I mean, if you could do template periodograms and search for specific signals and data really fast, um, you can do a lot of really powerful science with that. So I encourage you to just take a look, look for efficiency improvements, um, bugs, but hopefully there's none. So um, there's also other techniques for, for finding periodic signals. So I just listed these up here as well. Um, but yeah, that's, that's it. Any, any questions at all? Uh, does the kernel that you feed into uh, the function, is that a reads function at the end of the day? Um, so is the kernel, are you talking about the f of psi thing? That's um, Uh, are, wait, are you talking about the M function or the template itself? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it doesn't, ha it doesn't, I mean, I, I'm not sure if it technically has to be analytic. It can just be a black box as long as you can expand it in a, in a small number of harmonics, which means it has to be smooth enough that that's a decent enough approximation. So it, it, there might be like some sharp feature in the real, um, in the real uh, template, but if you could get away with just like smoothing that over or something, then, then that would be fine, but. Um, I don't, well, so, okay, yes, there is. So one way of thinking about it is if you do um, a change of variable to like cosine omega tau, where tau is, at, or theta two or whatever, where that's the phase shift, you get a lot of terms that are like h omega, cosine h omega two, which is like the whatever h harmonic or something. And then you can expand that in terms of cosine of uh, theta two using um, Chebyshev polynomials. So that's one way, I guess, of thinking. I actually don't know. I mean, if there's, if you can think of an intuitive way, definitely talk to me. But <laughs> that's the most intuitive way I, I know. But yeah. So can I think of this as something similar to wavelet and curvelet transforms? Um, uh, just that you're here basically handcrafting the kind of wavelet function. The, the uh, I'm sorry. The is it, very, is it similar to wavelet? Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I haven't thought a lot about that. It very well could be similar. Um, I don't know a whole lot about wavelet transforms, but if you do, I'd love to talk to you. So. Yeah. 